Hi, my name is Rory Richardson. I'm the director of Go to Market for Amazon Q. And today we are exploring all the use cases where Amazon has been applying generative AI in order to understand, well, how has generative AI been applied uh, at Amazon in order to transform our organizations and how we do things? So today we have G2. G2, you want to introduce yourself? Sure thing. I'm G2 Mishandani. Uh, I lead the applied AI team across our stores business, uh, and I've been with Amazon a little over 19 years now. That's a really long time, dude. 19 years. I'm just saying. I've only been here 12 years, and I can say that the, the changes that I've seen have been absolutely phenomenal. But I have to say, the changes that I've seen that are being brought on by generative AI has been the most transformative in the shortest amount of time. I think that's true. The The amount of time is probably the key thing here. The things change so fast, you're able to build so fast. Like that's probably the, the most exciting thing yeah. of getting an idea into some working version in days, not weeks or months. So tell me a little bit about your organization, sort of set it up, like what you're in charge of and what what where what the pain is in, in your world. And then we'll talk specifically about how you've applied generative AI to your business. So the team I lead is called the Applied AI team. Uh, we uh, Our charter is to look at uh, how do we accelerate the use of Gen AI uh, and other uh, traditional AI techniques uh, to improve our store's business, mm-hmm. uh, across the store's business. We, in our store's business, like we've been doing this for over 25 years now, uh, and we've scaled our business with people a lot. Uh, and that's just been the way we got things done. Uh, but now we actually have the tools and the means to uh, do things in a different way. Mm-hmm. And that means uh, a lot more can be possible. It unlocks new possibilities. Uh, so on the business front, uh, think about a process that took uh, days or weeks to do, uh, can be done in minutes. Mm-hmm. That kind of transforms how you think about the outcomes. So one of the things that I hear from customers a lot is when they're looking at, well, all of the problems that they have, but let's say in a nicer way, all of the opportunities that they have (laughs) internally to apply generative AI. I can I can tell you the 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 companies that are new to incorporating generative AI usually want to put it on like the highest risk, most customer facing and most complex workload and what we're finding is the best ROI is usually not there, but usually in something lower risk and more mucky that nobody wants to do. Have you found that to be true in your organization? I, I think definitely. Uh, if you think about launching something that is customer facing, uh, you have to kind of think about all the the inputs that you will get and how do you put the right guardrails around it? Uh, how do you adapt the right guardrails and tune it and then go through red, t- red testing to confirm that you're handling it well. Again, yeah, there are traditional ML algorithms that can t- train, take months to tune. Uh, but with with generative AI, you're able to train those models so much quicker that it's 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 a low risk area to add that to add that automation there because you always already have the people to handle when it goes bad. Right, and it's it's not facing a ton of external input that you have to kind of safeguard against. Do you find that? I don't know, whatever problem you apply generative AI, that it works 100% of the time? Never. <laughs> <laughs> so what degree of success are you shooting for? The way we talk to all the business use cases is, let's look for a step function change. If you're looking for a 10% change that used to be big in business, mm-hmm. it's not big enough these days. Because mm-hmm. uh, there are traditional ways you can optimize and, and get that person. Uh, we, look, we aim for 30 to 50% change right. at, in the first step. Sometimes you achieve that. Sometimes you're 20, 25%. But 25% on a, on a denominator that has hundreds of millions of dollars is still huge. How are you measuring the ROI for uh, that change? Because the reason why I ask is I find a lot of people don't have a, a good baseline of where they are right now because where we're seeing the best ROI is in stuff that they, they thought were constants and was the baseline. And so it's not well understood what the incremental value is. Now, I understand at Amazon, we measure everything, everything. 
But how do you, how does your organization look at ROI? So we've, we've chosen to focus on a particular class of problem and then build data around it. Uh, so I'm not looking to build productivity tools for every single Amazon. There are teams that are doing that. Uh, I'm going after an area that we define as knowledge operations, where we have uh, people uh, scaling a process, which is not physical. I mean, we have a lot of physical processes in our fulfillment centers and delivery network as well, but we have a lot of work where we do uh, knowledge operations uh, over and over again to scale the business. You're fixing the catalog that came from a seller uh, to make sure it's viable. Now you, you have to do that more the more you sell because the more catalog you have. And it's a good problem to have. But if you're able to use uh, generative AI to now avoid five of those touches, which can be measured because you actually didn't use five of those touches, mm -hmm. you can say, okay, I, I needed 100 touches a day. Now by avoiding five, five, five and three different areas, I've, I've reduced 15. I can easily measure the ROI of the, the return aspect of the investment. And then you sort of look at what is the investment and what is the consistent investment. There's, there's always an early investment to go try things. But then these solutions also need a lot of GPU and, and, and bedrock capacity. Mm -hmm. You can measure ROI there as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so within your organizations, like culturally, have you felt any resistance to incorporating generative AI into solutions, like uh, that's not the way we do it back, you know, uh, like is there a cultural shift or mindset that has to has to change in order to take advantage? Yes and no. I mean, at Amazon, we've sort of had the culture of uh, what we call the two pizza team, where everybody's empowered to improve their fitness function, their business, uh, the way they seem best. Uh, so as soon as uh, generative AI tools uh, were made available, people have been eager, in fact, to try things out. Uh, it's been easy to channel it in a direction that drives the ROI. Where we've seen a little bit of resistance in how to do things, where to do things. It's easy to get started with a, with a model uh, from open source that you go fine tune and now you have a working solution. But the space actually moves really fast you have new models coming out. So how do you architect so that you're not tuned to a very specific model and you cannot adapt the, the advances in the model itself? And that, that's a that's a thing that I think is still not perfect. Yeah. You have a lot of solutions that are tied to models. And as we talk to teams that are starting out now, we talk about like, how do you architect so that you're not tied to a model? And again, the the offering with Bedrock is perfect for that so that you not only are decoupled from the model, you also have tools to be able to evaluate uh, and migrate when you're ready to. I think that is such an important um, perspective and point because, I don't know, two years ago, if I was evaluating whether or not we were going to build or buy an application, we would run a POC, we would have KPIs, we would choose the winner, and we'd feel really good about our decision for at least two years. Whereas now, it's a week and so fundamentally, even how we're evaluating which path to take has fundamentally changed. Um, and I know, you know, we, we, we're, we love to play with new technology, but taking away the POC or the bake off or that evaluation is, um, is a very different way to look at technology, especially at the application tier. Totally. Uh, just, I mean, on that previous point, like, uh... Even a year back, the way teams were thinking about uh, building a solution that goes to production involved fine-tuning, fine-tuning a model. And then the infrastructure they needed around that was, I, I want to be able to fine-tune the model. But they quickly realized that six months later, I have a new, better model that can do better than my fine-tuned model on both performance and cost uh, that I have to use. Uh, so... You have to be adaptable to that. And, and it's, it's something that we've learned. Uh, like we do not know how powerful uh, prompt engineering would be. Right. Um, you know, Amazon's always been known as a disruptor in various markets, in various offerings. Generative AI feels like the first time we've disrupted ourselves. Yeah, I think we've, we've redone things we've done a certain way 
for more than a decade uh, in less than six months uh, in production at scale. And I was telling you before we started this, like that's been the most exciting part about taking an application development lifecycle that goes from, okay, a concept to a proof of concept running to production, like it from three months to a year. If we can shorten that to days and less than a week uh, to get something uh, prototyped and, and evaluated and then take it to production in less than a month. I mean, it, it's not just about saving time. It's about you could course correct your trajectory so fast you don't have to be perfect right away. Right. You can be iterative about it. So can you tell me about any other use cases that you're particularly excited about within your organization? Maybe something that you found transformative in the last three months. So uh, one of the things our team has been very excited about is building agentic uh, workflows. Yeah, uh, to that's automate. the holy grail, isn't it? Uh, and it has been a, a hard nut to crack because it means different things to different people. I found that same thing. What does a Gentech model mean to you? Specifically, the way we have implemented uh, the thinking, not the, the, the actual solution, is to invert the control. So we've had, uh, I've started talking about knowledge operating operations and, and the processes we run. We have a human-driven process in a lot of places where people are given a standard operating procedure that is pages and pages long. They're given access to a number of tools to get things done. And then every once in a while, we make an improvement and give them a new tool. And they adopt that tool. You have to make a process change. Uh, you run through the change management. You, you build the metrics for it and you measure it. That's, that was a traditional way of improving a process. Mm -hmm. uh, and you need six, six, six sigma processes to do that. Because <laughs> you, you're basically engineering the process. The way we are implementing our agentic workflows is inverting the control. On the other hand, we have, we have these awesome, uh, both traditional services as well as ML models that we built and used over the years. Make those available in a, in a marketplace-like setting uh -huh. where it's not confined to a thing that a single team developed. So if, if your team developed a translation capability, there's no reason my team should go pull that again. Uh, and you're tuned to work in the Japanese language. It's like, okay, let, let's go use that. But I don't have to go make a custom integration that takes three months to do. If it's available in the marketplace, I can build an agent that uses that capability in a day. It's almost an extension of our concept of an API library because the APIs are reusable for multiple functions depending on how atomic you make them. It, it, do you find that to be a, a sort of a similar idea to make atomic agents that you can reconfigure into, well, different molecular applications? I, I, there is a piece just before that as well. Yes, but we also want those existing APIs that we've built over the years, thousands of them, uh, be available in a documented way uh, for use not by people, but by agents. Yeah. No, and, and then have these agents be reusable as well. And developers love documentation. That's their favorite thing, <laughs> like, ever. <laughs> Which is also another thing that generative AI has sort of changed the face of. Like, seeing code with good documentation is a very modern concept now. <laughs> well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us about the use cases within your organization. This has been a fascinating conversation, and I think we could go on for another couple of hours. We totally can. Thank you for having me. 